love her voice. I'm gonna miss it. <laughs> Are you really though? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry. So we um uh, okay. with utilitarianism. We're done with utilitarianism. Okay. Remember we went over pros and cons really quick there at the end? Okay. This so the next theory is called duty ethics or Kantian ethics. Okay, Kantian. Remember Kant, Immanuel Kant? He was the guy uh, and then you're struggling because he was the guy he was, remember, the guy that was one of those watershed moments in the history of philosophy where he was like, why are y'all arguing about whether or not we, like, empiricism friends, and, okay. yeah, why can't we be friends, remember? Empiricism and rationalism, why don't we just combine the two? Like, y'all are, why are you taking sides? Like, let's just do, we do both of these things. We think and we use our senses, so hello. Okay, well, he also developed this, this theory of uh, ethics, okay, where he thought that, Duty and obligation were the centerpiece of these ethics, but then also the, the secondary part of that is is that how you arrive at what you ought to do is through <coughs> using your reason. Okay, it's through using your reason. So look, here are some options. We 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 realize this this. You guys know this. Some of you know it more than others. Do you feel this like sense of duty at some point in your life? You know what it means to have an obligation to to something. And if you have kids, you definitely know what that means, yeah. right? You know what it means to have, like, to be kind of under the weight of something else, right? Okay. Well, here are some different options of ways that you could get, ways that duty could be imposed on you, okay? You could, it could be from criminal law, military law, right? We have laws, okay, that imposes an obligation on you to follow them. If you don't, you will get punished. That's kind of what obligation means. If you do, you'll get rewarded by not getting punished, <laughs> Okay, that's what obligation means. So it could be criminal military, military law. It could be a cultural norm, okay, even inside of a small culture, right, teen culture, okay. There are obligations inside high school culture, is there not? You feel them, okay, you feel the weight of them. Some people are like, what the F, I don't care, and they, they don't do it, right? <laughs> but they're the, they're the marginalized ones, okay. How about individual desire? Have you ever been like, had a craving for a certain food? Oh, yeah. yeah it's my yeah. duty to eat this burger. Yeah, and it feels like an obligation. Like, I have, have to. Have to, right? Like, it's, it gets to that point where you're like, it's not a starvation thing. Like, you don't have to do it so you stay alive. But it's like, I have to do it. I never really understood this until I got pregnant. Right. And now I realize <laughs> cravings are real things. Okay, pregnancy cravings, they're real. They really are. What's the Main one you had? Taco Bell nacho cheese sauce. I feel like that's I'm what it was. Pregnant. And I could not. <laughs> What's the weirdest craving you had? Like pickles and ice cream? No, it was never a combination of things. Okay. It was just that feeling of I had to have something from Taco Bell with that cheese in it or I was going to rip things apart and set them on fire. Like okay. it was like weird. how someone weird. Like how someone I felt outside of myself. Like, like how a smoker craves a cigarette or something like that. Like Maybe we're like you have moments. to have it. Yeah. Okay, so it could come from there. Look, also an obligation could come from religion. Sorry, I'm going to probably shut you down so we can make sure we get through this. Yeah. And if we get through, then we can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> so another obligation can come from religion, right? That, that's even apart from laws, apart from desire. Okay, you have obligations that come from a religion that you, that you might follow. Make sense? So we have this sense of obligation and duty from these different areas. But, but what Kant said is that really the only real, like, way down there deep, real sort of obligation comes from your sense of reason, okay? And when you use your sense of reason, you understand that all moral truths stand by themselves, they are autonomous, and they are self-contained. When you really look at it, if you're really looking at it with a rational mind, barring any defeaters, okay, then you'll see that moral truths are autonomous and self-contained. They are obligations in and of themselves just by the fact that they exist. Okay, so for example, moral truths like humans have value. If that is a moral truth and you see that clearly, then obligation follows. Like you ought to respect human life, you ought not to take it, you ought to, you know, thrive and not just survive, those types of things, right? Obligations follow from a clear sense of what moral truths are and you arrive at that clear sense by, by via your rational capacities. Does that make sense? 
Okay, that was his idea. So therefore, he said the only because reason plays such a huge role in this, the only rules that you should adopt like this in this system, right, in this duty system, okay, are the, the only rules you should adopt are the ones that are logically consistent and the ones that are not self-contradictory, which kind of says, that says, says the same thing, okay? Ones that don't contradict themselves, ones that don't contradict the rules of logic. Those are the rules that you should adopt, okay? If a moral rule is logically contradictory, then you should not adopt it. Probably it's not a moral rule to begin with. Is this, is this clear? Okay, mm -hmm. it's a lot up here, right, in your head. Okay, a lot of clear thinking, but he thought moral truths are so obvious, they're so, like, true, <laughs> so big and weighty that if you just looked at them and looked at them clearly, then obligation would follow from that, and that's the system, right? That gives you your oughts and ought not to. Okay? Okay, so he says in that way, then, rationality, being rational in that way, is a source of freedom because look you don't have to go ah oh, should i do this should i not i don't know what's the right thing to do all you got to do is look at what are the moral truths what are my obligations from that all you, you you already have rationality by merit of the fact that you're a human so all you got to do is use it okay clear off any defeaters and there you go so it's a sense of freedom it gives you value because it recognizes what if what you have as a human that other animals don't have, which is that rationality, okay? And then it gives you the obligation that we're needing. Remember way back our definition of morality, one of them was it has to recommend action, right? A moral rule has to recommend what you do. Well, this does. It tells you to look at this, or it mostly does. It tells you to look at the moral, the moral truth and then get your obligation based off of that. Is this, are you tracking with all this? Is this okay? Flowing-ish, mostly? Okay. Okay, to do that, to arrive at any type of code of conduct, then he developed what's called like a, it's what's called a categorical imperative. To try to figure out like, okay, fine, it's one thing to say go and look at the moral truths and come up with an obligation, but that come up with part can be a little dicey. <laughs> okay, a little like uh, I don't really know what that means. And so he came up with a categorical imperative to help you sort through those things. Okay. This is the categorical imperative, the second bullet there, this is it. Act only, it's one of those like, oh, i got to think through all those words, okay? Act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. <coughs> yeah, it does make sense, but it's a weird way of saying it, okay? So he's saying you should only do those things that that you act and think this at the same time. You're doing it, and as you're doing it, you're thinking Yes, I think this should become a universal law. Only do those things. Okay? That even at the moment you're doing it, you're thinking, yep, this should become a universal law. Everybody should behave this way in this scenario. You should only do those things. Okay? So this would take out this would take out all the instances of you going, well, I know this isn't really right, but I want to, or given the circumstances. You know, nobody else is held to this standard, but I am. Right? And then that takes out all of those. Okay, the only things you should do are the things that you think should also become a universal law for everybody else in similar situations. Does that make sense? Okay, those are your rules. That's your standard. So only do those things where you're like, yep, I'm gonna I think I should do that, and I think that that should become a universal rule, so yeah, I'm gonna do it. Okay, that's the standard, that's the filter. Okay. So <clears throat> we act uh, it, has, it kind of comes in two parts if we talk about a maxim and then talk about the universal part. So when we talk about a maxim, that means that we act on a we act we act based on a proposed rule. So we have a rule out there. That's the proposed rule. We're going to kind of run through this filter and see what happens. But when we talk about a maxim, it's a proposed rule, but it applies to every decision and choice. Okay, or at least relevantly similar ones. Okay even when we're not consciously aware. So this is kind of like setting up filters in the background that you that rule out things before you even get there. You know, it's like when you're online shopping, right, and you like apply filters, okay, to rule out different sizes or styles or whatever. Okay, it's like that. So even when you're not consciously aware of it, it's there and it guides your behavior because you've already set those filters in place in the background. Okay? Um, and then part two, the universal part, should we act on the discovered rule is the question. Okay, we've got this rule, this filter in place, should we act on it? 
Well, the very next question that needs to happen is, do we want everyone to abide by the same rule? If the answer is no, then don't act on it. If the answer is yes, then do act on it. Okay? Remember, the basis, the basis of all of this is rationality. There's a lot of thinking in here, right? A lot of like deciding yes, no, okay, well, yes means this, no means this. Very rational, okay? Very kind of cut and dry type thing. Okay? Okay, some positive, positive points about this theory. The concept of duty anchors morality in this theory. That seems to be a good thing, because if, if morality is anchored only by something like desire, let's say, that becomes real sketchy real quick, right? Because people's desires are different, and some people's desires are sketchy. And some people's desires only serve them and not anybody else, right? Like your favorite flavor of ice cream or something. Okay? So morality should be tied to something we ought to do whether we want to that particular day or not. Okay? It should be something that doesn't depend on our desire, but rather on our obligation as a human. So I think that's a positive point. I think it gets at that and tries to kind of take a hold of that and make that a central part of the theory, and I think that's valuable. Also, it establishes a definition of right and wrong that's not open to interpretation. Okay? If it's a rule that you think everybody should act on, then you should do it. Now, some people will say, well, it's still interpretation because what if one person says, yes, everybody should act on this, and another person says, no, not everybody should act on this, right? Then it's still open to interpretation, but we're talking like big things here. We're not talking about little nitpicky situations, okay? We're talking about, should I murder this person or not, okay? Yes. Big, big scenarios. Quits <laughs> freaking me out. And it does seem to coincide a little bit with intuition. It does kind of jive with our seams, the way the world seems to us. Okay? It seems that there is this nature of morality that makes us do stuff even when we don't want to. Okay? It seems like that's part of it. Because some days we do, like, I want to be a good person. And some days we don't want to be a good person. We don't really care. But it doesn't, it, but that, it doesn't care about that. Okay? Which kind of keeps us in check, and that's kind of a good thing. Okay? Also, it does seem to be the whole idea of, like, treat somebody like you would want to be treated. It kind of includes that idea in there, too, which also seems intuitive to us. Okay? However, there are some potential problems. What happens when duties contradict? Okay? We have a duty to tell the truth, but we have a duty to protect innocent lives. So you lie to a murderer. Do you? I mean, we would probably say yes, lie to somebody who's about to murder somebody, right? To say, oh, they're not here. Huh. They ran that way when really they ran that way, right? I mean, we would choose lying, okay? We would choose lying over telling the truth in this situation because we think that the value is greater with the innocent life than it is with telling the truth. We would do that, but the problem is, is that the theory doesn't tell us to do that, right? The theory says... Always tell the truth no matter what, because that's if you're going to tell the truth, then you must think everyone should tell the truth all the time no matter what. And if you're going to protect innocent lives, that means you must think <coughs> everyone should protect innocent lives all the time. But the problem is now we got to choose a situation where we got to choose between the two. It doesn't tell us what to do in those scenarios. And even though they're rare, they do come up. Okay? And then what about consequences? Um... <laughs> I have this example that's always, it's never very good, but it's always kind of interesting. If you want to read it, I'd be glad to give you a copy of it. But um, it has to do with stealing a car from a dealership. Like, who actually owns that car? I mean, we could say, well, the dealership owns it, but not really, but sort of. Okay, to the people that make the car, like... Like the company. Right, the company itself, does it own the car? Okay. When when you steal a car from, like the example is, when you steal a car from a dealership, it, it brings into question the concept of ownership. Like who owns the car? Now, do you own the car because you stole it? I mean, is that how it works? Like when you steal something, then you own it? Or is it just you're in possession of a stolen thing? Right? Yeah, possession of stolen property, and then you can go try and sell it or something. But you could say that it's not really yours. But what does that even mean? Right? What does it even mean? So this idea of trying to rationally think through stuff like that based only on the facts that are in front of you and like these moral truths, sometimes they're not as clear as you think they are. Okay? And consequences 
don't seem as straightforward as they should be when the moral truths aren't as straightforward as they should be. And finally, what about rules that don't need to be universalized? For example, being polite. Okay. Uh, in different cultures, being polite means different things. And some things that we do here are to, to be polite are extremely offensive in other cultures. Right? So what about that? Do we like universalize it just within our culture? Or do we like, how do we do that? We say everyone should be polite and we should, that's a universalizable rule, right? Everyone should do that all the time. We should be polite. Yeah, but what is, what about, what if that means something totally different? Like I don't, you know, it doesn't give us any guidance there. Does that make sense? I always use the example of when I used to live in the Micronesia Islands and I worked with a lot of Filipino people and they, uh, like when we want somebody to, to come, I think I've told this before, we want somebody to come over here and join you, what do you do with your hand towards them? Yeah, something like this, right? Come over here, something like that, or a hand or whatever. Yeah, this is like giving them the finger. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> nope. You do this. <laughs> turn, your, turn your hand upside down. Yeah, she kind of did it. Yeah, like it's this way, right? Not this way, but this way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, underneath this way. When you point, you know, we, you know, your mom says, don't point. That's kind of cool because you, know, you know the intention by which way their hand. If someone does this, you're like, oh, go over there. It's going to be friendly. If they're like this, you're like, all right, let's fight. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like something else. So. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, when, you know how your mom always tells you, tells you not to point? Don't point at yeah, them, don't right? Point at them. Point I mean, but still, we point at stuff now as an adult. Like, we're like, hey, look over there, right? We actually use, use our pointy finger to point at stuff. They never point at things. Ever. Okay. They do this. Not with their finger like this or the knuckle. Okay. Like this. Maybe like this. Or they point with their lips. Like that. No joke. No joke. <laughs> Happens to me. Where, yeah, where, where is that? My dad was a contractor, like a superintendent at a big job. And so we'd ask where things were a lot of times and they'd go like that. We'd be like, what? <laughs> like, can you be more specific? You know, like this. So if you see me, like, you know how I often when I see you around campus, you know, and I do this to you like that, that's a that's a holdover from way back then. My whole family does it. We're like, so. <laughs> and we're like, you know, we do we twitch our head all the time all the way towards things from when we lived there. But, yeah. Anyway, so what happens when things are different? Yeah, the intent may be the same, right? I'm trying to be polite by asking you to come over here and say, hey, you, idiot, get over here, right? I'm trying to do this. Okay, but this is really offensive to you, and I don't know that. I'm trying to be polite. But I'm actually being incredibly rude. I think you knew that. You probably knew it too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's shoot kind of like, It's kind of like lost in translation. <laughs> kind of like yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't tell us how to navigate those scenarios where it's kind of like the fact value thing. Like the value is the same. Like be polite, but how you get that done is different. It doesn't. It kind of leaves us in the lurch there. Okay. Next theory. How are we doing? Oh, I'm nervous. Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. The next theory is called, we've got two more, this one and one more, okay? So the next theory is called virtue ethics. This one is interesting because it focuses less on doing the right thing and more on being the right kind of person. So you'll see a lot of departure from this of this theory from the other theories. The other one's like, well, this is okay. It's like utilitarianism, right? If more people are satisfied over here than in this, then you should do that. Or if the rule can be universalized to everybody, then you should do that, right? A lot of it seems like a lot of sort of sorting out and like, okay, there you go. Almost like a math problem, right? This is not like that at all, okay? This one focuses on the overall purpose of human life. It doesn't get very detailed. It looks kind of takes a step back to try to look at things. So overall purpose of human life, if we had to really boil it down, would be something like live well and achieve excellence and skill. Okay? Live well and achieve excellence and skill. Don't just do mediocre. Don't just get by. Don't just survive, but thrive. Okay? That's what we would say like probably most, if not all of you, are trying to do in your own ways. Okay? You're trying to live well. Okay? You're trying to achieve some sort of, I don't know about excellence, which I'm trying to get you to do, but skill at least, right? You're trying to go to school so that you can get a better job or do whatever, right? Try to uh, obtain something. Okay. So virtue ethics um, defines and tries to develop what it what what is meant by good people and the good life. 
Okay, remember that word good, right? Has a moral weight to it. Okay, so what is a good person and what is a good life? That's what they try to address here. They say that virtues are the characteristics that lead to being a good person and that lead to being a good life. And so therefore they're focused on trying to like develop a good person that will then go and lead a good life. Does that make sense? So they're way more focused on who you are as a person because they think that who you are as a person will then result in actions that are good. So not so much concerned about the actions you do, they're more cons because they think that if you're a good person, then the actions will just follow. You don't have to worry about it, right? But let's develop a good person so that you're thoroughly, like from the inside out, a living a good life. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay. Yes, kind of? Okay. Keep going. If it doesn't make sense, then tell me. But first we need to ask ourselves what exactly is virtue, okay? First of all, virtue is something that is learned. I know sometimes we talk about it in a sense where like, well, that person is just more virtuous, right? It's kind of an old tiny way of talking, but virtuous than this person, but really virtue is something that's learned. It's different from personality, okay? So we're not talking about somebody who's naturally a goody two shoes, right? We're talking about something that can actually be learned and acquired. Okay, so if you don't have it, you can get it, all right? Personality is more genetic. Right? And it has a little bit having to do with your environment and that kind of thing. Okay? Everyone should, should, should possess, according to this, everyone should possess certain virtues, but they might have different expressions depending on your personality, which you don't learn, you just have. Does that make sense? Okay, so the point is, is that virtues and personality are different. So don't just chalk it up to, well, I'm not, just not a patient person, can't do it. I'm off the hook on that one. That's not, that's not true according to this theory. You might have a personality that makes it more difficult for you to be patient, but you can still learn to be patient, okay? Virtue is not just good character traits. I mean, it is good character traits, but it's not just dispositions. It's not just leanings towards something. You know how some people are just sweet, okay? My daughter, for example, Jantry, is sweet. She's a firecracker, but she's sweet. And so I remember like when she was younger and thinking like, like 10 and 11, thinking, she's so sweet. I hope she stays sweet. Because usually girls, as they get older, they get less sweet. All yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys have no space to talk right now. Talk to girls. <laughs> okay, well, usually when they get older, they get, I mean, frankly, kind of bitchy. There's a period in there where it gets crazy, right? Yeah. And then usually, <laughs> usually they come out of it, but, you know, some people don't. Okay, so it's not just, right, we're not talking about just the disposition to be sweet or not sweet. Okay, those are not virtues. That may make it easier or more difficult for you to learn virtues, but they're not virtues. And then um, virtues do result in good acts, and virtues do assume a real difference between good and evil. They really do think that there is a good and that there is an evil. Some actions and, and traits and virtues are good, some are not. Which then, because some are good and some are not, that assumes that you ought to be good. So there is a good, there is a bad, and you ought to be good. Okay? And then finally, virtue is not just one thing. Okay? It's, I mean, it's, it's not just one virtue. Like, well, I have, you know, the virtue of kindness, but not the virtue of patience. It doesn't happen like that. It comes all at once. It's a package deal. You may be stronger in some areas than in others, but it all comes at once. You can't just, like, pick and choose the virtues you want. Okay? According to this theory, according to Plato and Aristotle, virtue is a, virtue is a thing. Okay? It's a whole package. Um, so... Plato, speaking of Plato and Aristotle, they had really different views of what virtue was. So we're going to go through this decently quickly. Uh, Plato's answer to what a virtue was is that you've got, first of all, Plato thought that, and I've talked to you guys about this before, I think, that justice underlie, undergirded everything. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have we talked about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about justice. Okay. So, so he thought that justice was the foundation of a good of a good society, a good person, okay? And it kind of had applications in all other areas of life. And so it ran through everything then. So then the other like major uh, virtues he thought tied to directly to parts of yourself. So for example, in yourself, okay, as part of your person, you have physical appetites, okay? Think food, sex, okay? You also have uh, your spirit, which is like, your life inside of you, okay, what makes you alive, okay? This might be like your, um, 
your volition, your will, right, your get up and go, okay, that thing that says, yes, I'm going to do that. Does that make sense? And then you also have your reason, okay? The reason is the rationality part that goes, yeah, I don't know if that's a good idea, but should I eat now? I don't really know, okay? That's, that's your reason part. So he thought that virtues had to match, or they did, they just naturally did kind of match parts of yourself. So this virtue of temperance went hand in hand with your appetite and evened out your appetite, kept your appetite in check. Do you know what temperance is? Yeah, it's a, I looked it up. Well, it's like self-control. Yeah. 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 Kind of like not letting anything go too crazy either way. I use the example of tempering things in cooking when you're wanting to slowly raise the temperature of something when you're cooking yeah. stuff. Yeah, like the eggnog stuff, right? I make homemade egg eggnog sometimes during the holidays, and I have to use egg yolks that have to be heated. But when you heat eggs, what happens? They cook. Yeah, so I don't want cooked eggs. That's gross in my eggnog, right? But I do have to heat it so I can cook them so they're not raw. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I want to cook them without scrambling them. So I heat cream and dribble, dribble, dribble the cream into the egg yolks slowly. So I slowly raise the temperature of the egg yolks. And then once they're warm, then I can combine them with the rest of the cream and they won't cook. Does that make sense? That's called tempering, tempering your eggs. Okay, so you slowly bring the temperature up. That's the same thing here. Temperature, or tempering, okay, temperance, same deal. Let's even it out. Let's make things be a little more, less crazy. Okay? Same thing here. Look, your spirit, your get up and go, your like actual will, your volition, right? Sometimes, uh, probably when left to its own devices, most of us would not be as out there as we ought to. More comfortable, more easy to sit and binge on Netflix. Okay? But courage is the thing that says, no, by golly, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Okay? Courage is that thing that says when this, when this is attacked, that stands up for yourself. Where you go, no, that's not right. That is unjust. Okay? And then the virtue of wisdom is the thing that informs your reason. Some of you have this, and some of you need to become stronger in this area. <laughs> okay? This is the thing that says when you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the I don't know what the right thing to do is. Wisdom steps in and helps you determine what the right decision is. Then courage helps you do it. Temperance keeps everything in check. Okay? So this is how Plato saw uh, virtues. He also saw these virtues as if we're like, well, how do we know what real temperance is or what real courage is? Like, how do we know that? Well, he related that to his idea of the forms. He thought, remember the forms? Non-physical realities that are out there somewhere, okay? He thought that there really was a real temperance that's out there somewhere. There is a real the wisdom is out there, and the courage is out there somewhere. And the closer that we got to mimicking that, the better off we were. Okay, so that's how we know what real temperance is, is if it looks like the real temperance, which is out there as a form, okay? And the way that you actually uh, get better at being, develop your virtue, is purely by acts, okay? For him, it was a balancing act. So if you wanted to get better at being temp temperate with yourself, if your appetite was getting out of control in one area or more, then you just needed to perform more acts that were on this side rather than on your appetite side, and the scale would tilt towards you being a temperate person rather than you being guided only by your appetite. Okay? This frame is pretty simple. Right? Just do more stuff over here and you'll become that kind of person. Okay? For Aristotle, it was different. Okay? Aristotle didn't think of it as a balancing act. He thought of it as a sweet spot. Okay? Not a balancing act, but a sweet spot, a middle ground. Okay? He thought it was a middle ground. It's a means between two vices. Virtue is that sweet spot between too much or too little. Okay? So here's an example, right? If too, too little would be a defect, right? Too much would be an excess. Has your mom ever told you too much of a good thing is not a good thing? Right? Okay, same, same idea. Too much of a good thing is no, is no good. So think about this one. Like I usually use the, the uh, well, we'll go ahead and use the remorse one, okay? So he would think that remorse would fit right here in the center, okay? Remorse, feeling bad about something, okay? If you did not, if you had, if you had too little of that, then you would be indifferent. Who cares? Who gives a rip? Okay, that's not always a good way to go. Rarely is it a good way to go. Okay, if you had too much of it, though, you'd be like overridden with guilt that was totally unnecessary, right? What if it was not 
your fault at all. What if you're just, oh, woe is me, I'm a worm, I'm such a terrible person, right? We know these people that just feel guilty all the time, and it's crippling, okay, and annoying, right? So that's too much. What you want is that sweet spot in the middle, okay, remorse, a healthy dose of remorse. There can also be a healthy dose of pride, right? If you're not, if you have a defect, okay, then you never recognize your own abilities. You never give yourself credit for anything, right? Which, which is not healthy, okay? You're like, oh, well, you know, I guess that it's what is one good enough. Like your teacher's like, yeah, that's awesome, and you're like, ah, what my best work, right? You're always critical of yourself, okay? You know, you don't, you're over here in the defect. You have no pride in your own, in your own accomplishments, okay? So that's a false humility over here. However, if you have too much, you're vain. Okay, which is also annoying, very annoying, okay? What you want is this sweet spot in here that recognizes I've got improvements to make, but I've also made some good contributions to the world. These are good things I've done, okay? That's healthy, okay? That's good in the, in the middle there. Does that make sense? This is Aristotle's view of what virtue was. That makes more sense. Uh, to me it does too. The forms, I'm not, I'm not on board with the forms, so that's a little weird to me. Okay, positive points about this. It is a comprehensive system, okay? It is a comprehensive system, meaning it really does, like, cover pretty much any scenario you could get yourself into, right? It just kind of, like, it's, a, it's comprehensive in that it deals with the whole person, your whole life, okay? It gives you guidance on a large spectrum, but with depth, which is pretty sweet takes into account things like relationships, which are important to us, and then takes into account things like being, like who we are as a person, which also seems like it ought to be a consideration in a conversation on ethics, okay? So far, the other theories we've had focus a lot more on what we do rather than who we are. This one focuses on who we are and less on, who we, on what we do. It includes the concept of ethical ideals, right? These virtues are ideals that we're striving for and trying to get towards, which is intuitive. That seems to be something like we're always trying to be better people, right? We're always going towards somewhere, and that seems like a good thing. When you set forth an ideal in front of somebody, that's usually the best way to promote progress, which is, so that's, that's a, good, a good point. It has intuitive approaches to right and wrong, okay? It's, it's ideas of what's right and what's wrong. A good person at doing things according to these virtues seems to be right. Somebody who doesn't uh, act according to these virtues seems to be wrong or a bad person. That seems intuitive most of the time. That's how it works. And then finally, it doesn't limit judgments only to acts. This is really important because we all know that good acts don't equal good people. Okay, good acts don't equal good people. Good people do good acts, according to this theory. But if you only do good acts but never focus on who you are as a person, you're never going to be a good person just by doing good things. I'm sure you all know some really terribly selfish and blind blind people, as far as not really blind, but like their, their worldview, right, that like volunteer all the time or donate to charities and stuff like that. Okay? They're not, those are good acts, but they don't make a good person. It's a one-way street. It doesn't work the other way. Okay? Okay. So potential problems with virtue ethics, though. Does it help us really know what to do, though? <laughs> if you're in a scenario and you're like, I'm a virtue ethicist, right? What do you do? Basically, what it can help you with is you should be a good person. But that doesn't always help a lot, okay? So it, that's a problem. That's not very specific. Can virtues be used badly? I think that's possible, which is, a, which is frightening, okay? doesn't answer the question, why should we be virtuous? Why are we even talking about this? Why is it the case that we have this ought attached to being virtuous? Why is that? And then finally, how do we handle conflicting virtues, such as um, honesty and kindness? Okay? If, you're, if your girlfriend comes to you and says, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> Just did like Lincoln. I mean, you have an obligation to exercise the virtue of kindness and the virtue of honesty. But in this scenario, they conflict. And somebody could say, well, it's ultimately kind to tell her the truth. Yeah, try it and then tell me what you think. 
you just say, Shit, that's not, that's not the But if you were to be kind, <laughs> well, if, if, you were, you, if you were to be kind, then you'd have to not tell her the truth. Like if, uh, like the whole deal with the lying to a murderer. Yeah, unless Kaylee can come up with a loophole for us. What? If you lie to her, it's protecting your own life, but if you tell the truth, it could, you know, it's the right thing to do, but... The correct answer is, I just don't think it's for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of it, doesn't look look bad. it doesn't make you look bad, it just doesn't make you look good. <laughs> Would you, you rather date a liar yeah, who's going to spare your feelings yeah. or someone who's honest with you? It depends. When it comes to clothes, I'd rather you spare my feelings. Uh, I'm not going to lie. So you want to pick and choose when your spouse is being a liar? And sure. Yeah. Somebody normally lies about stuff like that but tells the truth with other more important things. I'll take that hands down any day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Natural last one. Last one. Natural law ethics. Okay. This one is kind of like it has a lot of words, but don't be fooled. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Morality, it, this the claim is morality is universal. Remember, we're in the, in the section where we have universal theories, okay? Morality is universal, and it's grounded in, ra in our rational nature. Kind of like the duty ethics, right? But it goes a little deeper than that, okay? So these laws, these moral, moral laws are unchanging, eternal. In other words, they've always been there, and they always will be. They're universally knowable. Get that. They're universally knowable. That doesn't mean that everyone does know them. It just means that they're able to be known by anybody, anywhere, all the time. Okay? And because that's the case, they are also binding for anybody, everywhere, all the time. Okay? These laws exist based on the teleology of humans in the universe. That means the way that humans are the way that we're made, okay, the way that we are, and the way that the universe is, and our relationship in the universe, that's where these rules come from. Because of the kinds of things that we are, and because of the kind of thing that the universe is, this is where these rules come from. This is where these obligations come from. Okay? It is grounded in the idea that common, rational human nature shares common goals. So if we are all humans, and I'm pretty sure we mostly are in this room, okay, we all have the same rational nature that that helps identify us as humans, okay? We're all on the same playing field that way, okay? We're all on the same level, and because of that, there's these common goals that we all have. Now, they may be basic, right, but it, we, we all have them, okay? Um, Aristotle, for example, thought that this common goal was happiness, right? That happiness is the only thing that we do for the sake of itself. He actually thought that you do that through four ways. Procreation, some of you are like, mm-hmm, that's right. Life, like doing life well, okay, living a good life. Knowledge, and this is where most of you bail. You're like, no, knowledge is not happiness. <laughs> knowledge and then society, living in a just and well-functioning society, okay. Uh, and Aquinas thought that the common goal was do good, avoid evil. Like I said, they're basic, right? Do good, avoid evil. So he, they thought that, I mean, the theory says that we have common goals. This is what these two people thought those common goals were. That every human, because of the fact that they're human, and the way that they're constructed and the way that they think, this is what their common goals are. Okay, does that make sense? Common goals, okay. Natural law is general, kind of like virtue ethics is general, right? So you use that as your background and then derive rules from that. Okay, so you recognize, if you're going to be a natural law theorist, you recognize that humans are all the same in, that, in this way. Okay, you recognize that there is, because we're all the same, because the universe is the way it is, and because we have a relationship in the universe, then there are certain things that are going to be binding for all of us. Okay, and the way that we uh, come about those rules, get, get to those rules, is through our use of reason. So that kind of goes back to the Kantian ethics. Does this make sense? There is a standard. Everybody can know it. Not everybody does, but everybody can know it. And it's binding for everybody. Good? Positive points. It is very intuitive. This, this is where you, like, natural law theorists would say, from those conversations we've had before where we're like, Murder is, everyone thinks that murder is wrong. We define murder as killing a human for no good reason, right? 
everyone knows that. Why does everyone know that? Natural law theorists would say, because we're humans, because of the way that we're made, we recognize these things. We all know this. Any culture, any person, anywhere will agree to that because they think that's one of those naturally, like one of those binding laws that everybody knows, just way deep down, right? We know this, okay? So it does seem to be intuitive because there does, there does seem to be some things that we all know. And we might disagree on the details, but we don't disagree on the fundamentals. So that does seem kind of interesting, okay? And then it does start with these common experiences. Okay, we, are, we have vastly different lives, but we are all human. We all share very similar experiences, maybe at different times in our life, maybe in different contexts, but for the most part, we are kind of all the same. We have the same experiences, okay? And so this kind of seems to jive with that. We have same experiences, we have same build, you know, same, we're, we're made the same. Why not have the same views on big moral standards? Um, and then it does establish a universal, which I think is really helpful for moral, for morality. It does, it's not relative. It's a universal, it's an absolute. Okay, potential problems. This one does tend to sometimes commit the naturalistic fallacy, where it says, the natural, where the fallacy <coughs> would be is, look, just because humans are this way, doesn't mean we ought to behave this way. Okay, that's a naturalistic fallacy, and then the natural law theory gets awfully close to committing that sometimes. Or it just says, look around you. This is the way humans are. Therefore, we ought to think this way. We ought to shape our morals around this. But you can't always get an is from an ought, or an ought from an is. Yeah. And you can't you can't do that. It's a natural, it's called a naturalistic fallacy. And then finally, I mean, I don't know if you all agree with Aristotle and Aquinas' goals. I I mean, maybe should we go back to him? Yeah. Happiness through procreation, life, knowledge, and society. Aquinas, do good and avoid evil. I mean, okay, like I could be on board with that. I feel like I have, you know, like you probably not thinking, I had a chance to think about it, but it seems like there might be more than that, or maybe less, or maybe different, right? I mean, the, the point is, is that do we really agree on our goals? We could probably agree that we have the same experiences. We could probably agree that we're generally the same as far as how we're made, but like, do we really have the same goals? Really? Does that lead to having the same goals? if we're made the same way. Well, maybe, maybe not. It's not as clear as this, this one kind of just assumes that it, that it is. But that's not, that's not a fair assumption. I think there needs to be more thought behind it. Questions about this one? Yay! Give yourselves a hand. That was awesome. Good work. Excellent work. Yay me. Yay me. Okay. And yay me because I have two minutes to tell you one thing, okay? So this is the whole, like, I struggle with this every year because we go through this class and it's like a really big class and you're confronted at some point with some super boring ideas and some super complicated ones and some super important ones, okay? So it's really hard to figure out how to, how to end the class, you know what I mean? Because it's like, well, okay, well, thanks for being with me for 16 weeks like it just seems weird to me more than other classes because we talk about important things in here and honestly and I'll I mean not to be like cheesy or whatever but I like I remember all of my students like I really do like your faces are in my memory and I will think about you and like I, I really will like I really do have a have a care for you in my heart I really do I have more than one care multiple cares okay so I really do I really am concerned about your like concerned for your well-being. I hope you do well. I hope you succeed in life, like truly. Uh, if I could like talk to you each face to face, I would tell you that, honestly. I really do sincerely want that for you. Uh, maybe more than that though, I want you to be the type of people that think about what you think, okay? Not about what I think. Hopefully I've done a pretty good job leaving out what I think and just giving you some information, but Think about what you think about these things, okay? Now, after this class is done, you have a choice of whether or not to continue thinking about these things or not to, right? Before in the semester, you were kind of forced to every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, even if you forgot on Tuesdays and Thursdays and the weekends, right? But now that choice is up to you, okay? Now that choice is up to you, and now you kind of know what it's like to know some things. Okay, there's this quote that I, there's this quote that I like that says, the mind once expanded to encompass new ideas never returns to its original dimensions. 
Okay? Your mind, once it has been expanded to include new ideas, like it has been in this class, at least once, I know that's happened to every one of you at least one time, where you've considered something new, it will never return to its original dimensions. So I'm going to warn you that that may cause problems with your family, your friends, right? People that don't know what you now know about life and how to think about it. Okay? But don't let, don't let that squelch you. Teach them, by example, how to think about things that are important. But most important, please have reasons for what you think about things. Even if people disagree with your reasons, have good reasons, solid evidence for what you be the type of people that can have solid reasons and, and life won't shake you as much. Because you're like, this is what I think. At the same time, be open to learning new things. If you find something with better reasons, go towards that. Okay, be, be thinking, contributing, thriving, like living people, the fullest version of you that you can be. You do that a lot by understanding what it is that you think and understanding why it is that you think it. Okay, and I'm going to say this one, one more time. I really do care for you, really a lot. Like I get, like I can feel it right here in my throat. I really do a lot. I feel really emotional about it. Okay, but I'm also right down here in my office. If you ever need me for anything, a question about philosophy, a question about life, you need a place to hide, <laughs> you need a paper proofed, right? I mean, I don't, whatever, okay? Please, please know that I will be more, I'll be tickled if you came in and asked me. I would be more than happy to help you. Even after you transfer to another school, send me an email, right? I'll be there, okay? You guys good? Okay. Thank, thank you for a good semester. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I'll see you on Wednesday, right? Yes, I will post your study guide on Blackboard. Just a quick refresher. What time is the final? 10.30. Are you